application for Camel by Stephen Dolan and Phil White. Okay, and now we show that. All right, thank you. Uh, this is, yeah, as again, joint work with Leo, who's in the audience there. So, idiomatic programming, idiomatic code in OCaml tends to allocate an awful lot of memory. So, here's an example of a simple function in OCaml. Uh, it takes a graph represented as nodes, where each node is a list of edges, and it counts how many self edges there are, how many links there are from a node to itself. And it does this with a double nested loop. There's one loop iterating over all the nodes, then for each of those nodes, it iterates all, over all of the uh, nodes, all of that node's successors. So this code allocates some memory. It allocates 16 bytes to hold that reference counter. It allocates 32 bytes to hold the uh, closure that begins with fun node. But it also allocates 40 times n bytes, where n is the number of closures in the program, or sorry, n is the number of nodes in the graph for the inner closure, because that second closure, the fun suck arrow dot dot dot, that's actually nested inside the outer call to list editor, so uh, that has to be reallocated for every uh, for every iteration. It's slightly bigger than the outer closure because it closes over one extra value. So allocations in the camel are extremely cheap, but they are not free. Uh, this this may be a little odd for someone who's who's studied some garbage collector because uh, the copying garbage collector in a camel doesn't actually traverse the uh, short-lived allocation, so it, it, it might seem that they are completely free. But they have two, two more subtle costs. The first one is all of those allocations get allocated in separate bits of memory. There's a big region of minor heap, and it lays them out one at a time, non-overlapping. That means that this program, which is only ever using one of those many closures at a time, uh, puts them all in separate bits of memory, so it uses a ton of different cache lines. Uh, so there's very poor cache usage of the program, even though it's not using, because it, it's essentially touching every cache line just once. Uh, the second issue uh, is that uh, the, um, each, each of those allocations brings you slightly closer to the next garbage collection. You're, you're using up uh, some of your remaining space, some of your remaining time before the next collection. So that means that a lot of things get promoted to the more expensive major heap which otherwise you might have been able to collect. Like extra, extra work gets done for the things that aren't the temporary allocations. So in languages other than OCaml, there is a, a standard solution for getting rid of uh, temporary allocations. You can put them on the stack. This works in C and C++ and Rust and various other languages. And stack allocation is great. Stack allocation, firstly, you reuse the space extremely quickly. The, when you're finished with the temporary data, you pop it off the stack. Then the next piece of temporary data that you want goes right back in the same exact bytes of memory. So those are still in cache. So those are still very nearby, very available, and very fast. Also, constantly pushing and popping things off a stack uh, does not advance the GC clock. It doesn't bring you any closer to the next collection. So it doesn't impose costs on the rest of the program. However, um, as decades and decades and decades of exploitable holes in C programs has shown us, it is hard to know that this is safe. Because when you're going to deallocate something right at the end of the function, you really need to be sure that you're not still using it. So doing this safely, like analyzing a program to show that stack allocating is safe, is not too bad if all of the uses of the thing are within the same function. If it's all syntactically just in a single block of code, we put something on the stack, we use it a few times, and then we throw it away. But Having to write all of the code that manipulates a data structure in line in a single function is a miserable way to program. So we really want to do some structured programming where we can like allocate things on the stack and then pass them around to other functions, have some modular programming, and still know that the result is safe. So the central question involved in getting, a in getting safe stack allocation to work is, when is it safe to do this? When is it safe to pass stack allocated values to another function, or even, like, especially in a function defined far away in another module? So there's a bunch of firework on this, of course. Um, there's a long thread of research that's on region variables, starting with the Toft and Telfin papers in the 90s, going through Cyclone and various other language designs, but particularly like made popular in Rust recently. And that works by attaching region variables to everything. So region variables represent a particular stack frame, the, the, the extent of a particular function. Uh, and you can annotate all of your types with what region they're going to be in. So for instance, here's a Rust structure that holds uh, two borrowed strings. Um, but note that there's this extra tick A that, that represents the lifetime of the strings. 
And that has to be threaded through to all of the fields. So you can't really use standard ML types like this. Uh, you have to like plumb these, these lifetime annotations through everything. Um, but it does like give you a means of describing lifetimes, and it does give an answer to the uh, to the question of when is it safe to pass it to a function. Um, it's very expressive. In Rust, you can describe all sorts of complicated patterns of uh, lifetimes, and, like describe very complicated structures, but it's syntactically quite heavyweight. You need to do a lot of work to explain why your program is correct to the Rust borrow checker. Uh, it answers the central question with polymorphism. Uh, if it is safe to pass a stack allocated value to a function, uh, if that function works for all regions. Um, so this is, this is what happens in Rust when you write a function which accepts a, a borrowed value. Uh, Rust has a bunch of syntax sugar, so usually you don't have to write the for all, and often you don't even have to write the alpha either and get silently inserted, and there's some rules called lifetime elision for where these variables get inserted. But at a theoretic level, that's what's happening. It's polymorphism. So I, I think this is a, a solid design in Rust. Uh, it makes some things quite awkward. Uh, because we're encoding these functions that take stack arguments as polymorphic functions, then it means if you're passing one of these around as a higher order function, then that suddenly becomes a higher rank polymorphic function because you're passing around things with for alls in them. So while it's extremely expressive and very flexible and like a generally nice design, uh, type inference basically doesn't work because higher rank type inference is hard and higher order functions are quite awkward. And while I, I'm I think Rust like, didn't make mistakes here. They're just the different priorities. This is not very good for a camel, where I really like type inference, and I use a lot of higher order functions. Uh, so we've taken a different approach. Uh, the system we're describing here is built instead on modal types. Uh, so we have these two modes, local and global, uh, which and, and importantly, these are not part of types. These apply to variable bindings. So in the context, each variable is marked as being either local or global. Global bindings are like the, the ones that we have in OCaml today. Those work. Th those are known to point only to things that are statically allocated or on the garbage collector heap or generally can are allowed to go anywhere. But local bindings, those are ones which are not allowed to escape their region. And a region is a, a function body or a loop iteration. So if you have local things in scope, you can use them now, but you can't return them and you can't leak them out by raising them as part of an exception or by storing them in the global structure. You have to just use them locally. Uh, so this is much less expressive than the like uh, Rust style region variables or lifetime variables, but it's an awful lot simpler. Um, and this I think is a better trade-off for a camel because we're like, garbage collectors are great. We're not proposing to get rid of the garbage collector. So it doesn't the, the mechanism that we have here doesn't have to express every possible usage of memory. Uh, it just has to like easily handle the basic stack allocation cases. So an important difference between uh, the modal approach and labeling all the types is that modes are naturally deep. Because we're labeling a binding, it applies to the whole structure of a, like even nested structure of a type. So here's that graph type that I had from the initial example where it's a list of nodes for each node is a record containing strings and a list of strings. And so if we have a local, like a, a variable at mode local, and it's of this type, then not only might the list be on the stack, but the nodes might be on the stack, the names might be on the stack, or the whole substructure of the thing may be on the stack. And this is just implicit from the mode of the binding, rather than having to be manually plumbed through all of the type annotations. In fact, the only place where we need to have an annotation here is when we want to not do that, when we want to do the, the transition and say that a particular field of a record is in fact always known to be global. So in this example, there's the part global thing where if you have a, if you have a local binding and it's of type part global, then the foo part is assumed to be local as well and that's not allowed to escape, but the bar part is known to be global and that's you're allowed to freely use that. You can return that or raise an exception or store it in the global or whatever you like. Uh, if people are familiar with modal types, the global underscore thing is essentially a box modality. It describes things that are always available in all future worlds, such as the one where your stack frame has ended. Uh, so these modes do show up one place in types. They show up in our function types. Uh, we have split the normal camel function type, the ARB, into two different functions. There's ARB, which takes a global, which takes a, introduces a global binding as a normal function. And there's the second type T, a local ARB, 
And that means that the argument is brought into the function at mode local. So this is an answer to that, that central question that I asked before about when is it safe to pass a stack allocated value to a function. And it's when the function promises not to let the value escape. And that's what this local thing does. Uh, that local argument can be used inside the function, but it can't be returned, it can't be escaped, it can't be stored in a global or anything. Uh, and the important thing here, compared to the previous solution involving polymorphism, is that there are no for alls in this. There are no lifetime variables, even hidden ones. Uh, so that means that, like, since this is just a standard sort of first order type, type inference continues to work in more or less the same ways that it does at the moment. Uh, it's, again, as I've mentioned, not as expressive as full lifetime variables, but it's an awful lot easier to fit into a language that's full of higher order functions and complicated types. Uh, so actually, as well as putting local on the arguments position, our function types also allow local on the returns. So this is a slightly unusual feature, but it's one that we found extremely useful. Uh, it means that uh, we can have functions which return stack allocated values. And this is implemented at one time because our, uh, <clears throat> unlike in C, the stack where local allocations go is actually a separate piece of memory uh, from the control stack. So that means that functions that want to do local returns, these local returning functions like f of x there, they can actually allocate on their parent's stack frame. Uh, so because it, it, it's uh, local return functions allow the, the local stack frame creation and deletion to be slightly out of sync with the control stack with the control operations. So this is like not used all that widely, but it's, it's, it's extremely useful when you've written an API where there are smart constructor functions, where there are functions whose whole job it is to call a constructor and do an allocation. And that allows those to have just as good a semantics, do the same sort of stack allocation as though it were directly inlined into the caller, because they're just allocating in their caller stack frame directly. Uh, so I'm just going to show briefly how this all hooks together in a, in a type system. Uh, so here is the, like, the classic typing rule for a lambda. You've got gamma showing the, the stuff that's in context, and we add the, the, the function parameter a type A, and we check that the body has type B, and if that all works, then we can say that the lambda expression fun x arrow E is in fact a function from A to B. So to get this to work with, with this modal type system that we've introduced, uh, we decorate this with a bunch of modes. Um, so there are three different modes going on here, I, J, and K. Uh, I is the mode of the closure itself. That's whether this closure should be allocated on the heap or on the stack. J is the mode of the argument to the closure. So that's whether the closure promises not to allow its argument to escape or whether it's allowed to, to leak it everywhere. And K is the mode of the return value. Uh, so that's whether it's, it's one of the uh, functions that returns a local that I showed in the previous slide. So in this typing rule, J and K just correspond to uh, J goes into the context above and K is how the body is typed. The interesting one is I, the mode of the closure itself. Uh, when uh, when you're making a uh, sorry, when you're making a, a closure, the mode of the closure itself uh, gets added to this box i. Uh, this is uh, a Fitch style locking operator. Uh, you may have seen some previous talks by people who were better at LaTeX than I am, where this was a padlock symbol. <laughs> um, uh, and what it does is it prevents uh, variable access. So that means that. Uh, this is a little clearer if I show you what the variable access rule looks like. In order to access a variable from the context, not only does it have to match the mode that you're trying to use it at, so you can use a global variable in a local context, but you can't use a local variable in a global context, it also has to be compatible with any locks along the way. So that means that local variables from an outer scope can be used inside a function only if that function is itself also local. Because if that function were global, then the closure would be allowed to escape, and the closure closes over the things in the context. That means it escapes as well. Um, so you just have this, this extra constraint, uh, which is what that, that lock is doing to ensure that the locality is respected even for closures. And the interesting thing that I'd like to point out here is that um, these, these rules that involve of variables i, j, and k, rather than explicit local and global words, this isn't a shorthand that I introduced to like make a fit in a slide. This is actually how the compiler works. Those are actually variables, and they are subject to inference, which means our type system is actually doing inference of which things are local and which things are global. 
so that means that it's actually quite easy to adapt some code to start using locals. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the example from the start where we're doing this double nested iteration. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to change the signature of list editor uh, to say that the uh, closure that it takes is local. And this is because list.iter promises not to hang on to that closure. List.iter expects a closure, and it's going to call it a bunch of times, but it's not going to like capture it as part of the return value or do anything other than call it. Uh, so that's the only change that we have to make. Uh, that, that We have to make that in the signature for list.mli, uh, but having done so, the implementation of the, the, the standard implementation of iter still type checks with that uh, more specific type. Uh, then uh, we write uh, the same example that we had before. And this time, all of the allocations that I talked about in the first slide, those all go away. Those, those all become stack allocations. Uh, and in particular, the reference cell for the count, that's, that can actually be locally allocated, even though it is used inside a nested closure. And the reason that that's okay is because both of those closures are themselves also locally allocated. So even though ref, the ref is captured by this closure, it's known that those closures themselves don't escape. So by the end of the function, it's safe to deallocate the ref because everything that references it, all of those closures, is going away as well. Um, so this is still a uh, work in progress. We're still actively hacking on it. So I'd like to point out two things where the story is not completely rosy. Uh, the first one is uh, particularly sharp-eyed audience members may have noticed that this is not exactly the same function that I showed you the first time. Uh, there is a very subtle semicolon unit after the inner list.iter, which was not there on the first slide. Uh, that's because that original call to list.iter is in fact in tail position, and it's a tail call. So an important part of tail recursion is that when you do a tail call, it's, it's supposed to be safe for space. You can't take up any stack space. So if you've done local allocations on your stack to avoid like leaking those in a tail recursive like in a tail recursive thing that should be constant space, you need to ensure that they're all cleaned up before you do the tail call. So you uh, a, a, to ensure that tail recursion remains safe for space, uh, a constraint that we have implemented is that you can't pass locally allocated things that were locally allocated in this function. You can't pass those as arguments to a tail call. Um, so that means that the function as written originally would not have actually been able to locally allocate the inner closure because it is passed as an argument to a tail call. But this is quite annoying. No programmer actually looks at that and thinks that's a tail call. There's, there's no tail recursion going on here. In fact, there cannot be any tail recursion going on here because list.iter never itself does a tail call. So there is no asymptotic space reason to want this to be a tail call. It just happens to be a function that ends in a call. Uh, so we're experimenting with various weakenings of the heuristic for whether things are tail calls to say that, well, maybe this thing shouldn't be a tail call unless you've explicitly asked for it. Uh, but it's it, it's a little tricky. And at the moment, we are finding ourselves annotating lots of things just to make them not be tail call because we never need them to be tail calls in the first place. And if they're not tail calls, then we get to locally allocate a lot of stuff. Uh, the other bit of trickiness of the system that I'd like to just mention briefly uh, is currying is currying is always a bit strange, but currying is increasingly strange with this. Uh, this function is not, in fact, the same type as that, because that first iter function uh, that accepts a local closure, and if you partially apply it to a local closure, you're going to get a local thing back. You don't get a, a, a heap closure that can escape because it closes over its first argument. So that second type is actually equivalent to this one. It says it takes a local closure and it locally returns the partial application. Uh, so this presents us a, a, uh, a minor backwards compatibility issue where some things like this, if it's if that, if you allow a definition like that to escape, then you may have to eta expand to avoid escaping a, lo a local thing. We found this one to be, we, we were worried about this one. It's not been such a big problem in practice. We've, because uh, we, we, we've actually, uh, switch to a version of Azure that looks like that internally at Jane Street, and we needed to update tens of places in the code base, as opposed to the tail call ones where we needed to update much more. Um, right, so this describes the system that we have for doing efficient stack allocation, and that, that was, in fact, our motivation was, let's make things go faster, let's put stuff on the stack. Uh, we were somewhat surprised to learn that locals are really useful for all sorts of other stuff as well. So as well as this iter thing, uh, it's quite common to write this sort of function in many functional languages where it's a with some resource. So it 
with file, opens a file, passes the file to a callback, then closes the file. And usually those are somewhat unsafe because you're going to close the file, but how can you be certain that the function that you passed the file handle to actually didn't keep it beyond the end of the close, didn't leak it out somewhere? Um, but with locals, uh, we even if you don't care about stack allocation, we now have this general way of talking about functions that do not capture their arguments. And that's exactly what you want here. And in fact, if you notice that there are two occurrences of local there, the inner one on local file handle says that the, the callback won't capture the file handle, but the outer one says that additionally with file promises not to capture that closure. And that's what allows you to nest multiple uses of with file because you can use the outer file handle inside the inner closure because that inner closure is also local. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a similar example is a, a immutable arrays. Uh, a nice way of describing an immutable array is to say that you can initialize it as a mutable array and then you freeze it. And then the frozen version is, immutable, is an immutable array. And this is implemented in various languages, but the trouble is to be safe, the freeze operation often has to copy the whole array because there might still be alias copies of this. But again, with locals, we can say the initialization function gets to play with the immutable array for a while, but can't keep it. Um, and we've we've thought about further extensions. Uh, Anton Lorenzen recently did an internship with Leo, in which he implemented a uniqueness mode on top of the modal system we have here. Uh, and that gives you a means of doing borrowing. Borrowing is a, uh, you can have a unique thing that you're only allowed to have one point or two, but then you can temporarily borrow it. And as long as using locals, you're sure that there'll be no more references to the borrow after the function returns, then it's totally safe to temporarily allow multiple references. Uh, and we've similarly thought about uh, using this as, as sort of dynamic capabilities for effect handlers and for all of the other reasons that you might want to have scoped capabilities. So in general, the stack allocation is efficient. We were, that was our motivation originally, but it turns out that the mechanisms are useful for much more than speed. Uh, so if you're interested in more, you can talk to me or Leo, or you can find the uh, implementation and documentation on GitHub. Thank you.